Hello, and thanks for joining this talk in which I will give some free reign to some of my more distractible tendencies and hopefully make a point in the process. This is John Weatherby and Loguti. They're in Northeastern Uganda where Weatherby recorded a lot of things in So, Loguti's language. Today, I'll invite you to join me to some of the other places that studying Weatherby's recordings has taken me. Uh, we'll start at the moment that I first saw them. So it's June, 2018 and we're in Joanna Weatherby's house. We're in an upstairs bedroom and Joanna, a vigorous woman in her early 70s, is on the top step of a small ladder pulling boxes off of a high closet shelf. The boxes contain recordings of linguistic elicitations, interviews, narratives, and conversations in which her father, John M. Weatherby, had documented speech in the endangered So and Nyangi languages of Northeastern Uganda while he was a history PhD student at Makere University in the 1960s and 1970s. I've addressed one angle of the question of why this precious collection of documentary materials was in a closet in Spain and why I had hunted it down and traveled across the Atlantic from my American home to find it in a paper in language documentation and description. So I won't dwell on either question for long today. I've included links to the paper and to the archive that I'm placing these materials in here. As for my own motivations, it's enough to say that I was interested in the materials for linguistic reasons. My doctoral research had involved questions of recent language change in Nyangi, and there was a 50-year-old record of language use in Nyangi and its closest relative, So, in this collection. I could digitize the audio recordings, scan the field notes, and dive straight into linguistic analysis. I thought. There's been a lot of interest lately in working with legacy materials in the field of language documentation. Peter Austin has addressed a number of technical and ethical issues that those using legacy text materials are likely to face. Case studies such as Gibson et al. 2019 and Vaughn 2020 detail some challenges in mobilizing legacy collections and making them discoverable. The papers in Dobrin and Schwartz 2021 illustrate a range of interpretive challenges and opportunities afforded by legacy materials, particularly when attention is given to the social matrix in which the materials were produced and transmitted. Overwhelmingly, this body of research on legacy materials has focused on materials that have already been placed in institutional archives. Dobrin 2021 is a noteworthy exception. Readers of much of this growing body of literature could be forgiven for thinking that proper work with linguistic legacy materials follows the relatively linear trajectory that I had imagined for my own work with Weatherby's materials. The researcher has a research question, consults a pre-existing corpus, struggles through technical obstacles, does right by the documented community in matters of discretion and representation, and perhaps leaves the materials better labeled than they were found. For reasons that strike me as quite intuitive, ethical concerns center around, on the one hand, the people and communities that are documented in the materials, and on the other hand, around the academic communities of today and tomorrow. My work with Weatherby's materials has been mediated by another relational dimension, though. So come back with me to June of 2018. We find ourselves again in an upstairs bedroom in Joanna Weatherby's home. You have a reference, year 2021, that can explain to you not only why these materials are in this bedroom, but also why I would want to be where the materials are, what I want them for. But there's something about this vignette, as I've presented it so far, that you probably don't have a exp great explanation for, and which I only passingly gestured toward in my earlier paper. It's all well and good that I want access to the materials, but why has Joanna Weatherby invited me to her home, given me a bedroom to sleep in, and fed me three meals a day, all while steadfastly resisting any sort of compensation? There's a trite answer to this question. She's excited to host me because she's excited that I want to look at the materials, and she's excited that I want to look at the materials because she loves her father. But I think that the point that I most want to make today is that the way that she loves her father shapes the specific way that she is excited for me to look at the materials. 
her care for the materials exists not only in degree, but also in kind. And the kind of care for the materials that she has comes with implications. Just as one example to make this point concrete, remember that we are standing in an upstairs bedroom in Spain after a transatlantic flight, rather than say, opening a parcel in my living room and retrieving it from a collection of reel-to-reel -reel tapes that can travel intercontinentally much more economically than I can. I had actually asked Joanne if she would be willing to ship the tapes to me so I could digitize them when I became serious about working with them. Her desire not to do so illuminates one important meaning that the materials have to her. They are treasured physical traces of her deceased father. Accordingly, she didn't want to surrender possession to them unless it was into the temporary, attentive care of somebody that she knew and trusted. On this level, Trust was a question of her feeling she could count on me not to misplace or harm the physical objects. And that's why I was making trips back and forth to Spain to retrieve and return items. On another level, though, she only wanted to give access to the items to somebody that she trusted to be charitable to the legacy of her father. This does not mean uncritical. Joanna read drafts of my 2021 article before it was published, and her feedback never resisted moments when I was, for example, critical of her father's data collection techniques or the academic quality of his article manuscripts. Instead, she's seeking to ensure that the legacy of her father in the public sphere bears the image of a man that she recognizes. So even though he was a PhD candidate in a history department, writing a history doctoral thesis using the methods of deriving history from oral tradition that were popular in the discipline of history at the time, she chafed whenever I referred to him as a historian. To her, he was a painter by, by vocation, perhaps a social anthropologist by disposition and some training, an outdoorsman by choice, but not a historian in any way that matters. To Joanna, the value of the materials was not simply as physical traces of her father, but as physical traces that helped to tell a story of him as a complex person who she recognizes. Earning her trust to work with his materials hasn't been a matter of demonstrating excellence in my own field of linguistics, but of showing sensitivity to and interest in her father's complex humanity. So we're back in Joanna's house, in June of 2018. It makes sense that the collection is here. It makes sense that I'm here. And in Joanna's hope that my work with her father's materials will fortify his legacy in a form that she recognizes, it makes sense that I have been invited here. Imagine that we haven't gone upstairs yet. We walk through the garden toward the home, passing under some arches that were once used to dry grapes, we enter the main door. We walk through the living room and on our way to the stairs, we are surrounded by stools and pots and paintings from Uganda, a bookshelf packed with old books and a wicked set of raptor talons mounted on a commemorative base celebrating the 1930 Oxford Lapland expedition. In the past four years, my research time has drifted back to that expedition for a few days every few months as uh, my fancy takes me. A 19-year-old Weatherby led and organized the trip, which counted among its members Charles Sutherland Elton, a foundational figure in the discipline of animal ecology, and Tom Harrison, who is called a polymath by Wikipedia, the most offending soul alive by his biographer, and The Barefoot Anthropologist by David Attenborough. I've forwarded scans of the publications resulting from the expedition to Joanna and helped her get in contact with archivists who have other materials from the expedition. Those archivists have in turn contacted, connected Joanna with an archivist at Maudlin College, her father's alma mater, where she will deliver Weatherby's diary and notes from the expedition to be digitized and archived at the end of this month. 
The historiography of British Arctic exploration in the first half of the 20th century is thriving. See, for example, Roberts 2011, Dodson Nuttall 2016, Serlin 2016. And I'm optimistic that these materials will prove of value to scholars in that field relatively quickly. I encountered a similar distraction of sorts a year later on a visit in which I was making scans of field notes and picking up the audio tapes for digitization in the United States. While trolling Google in an attempt to confirm some fact about Weatherby's biography, I stumbled across a new book about a scheme in which subterfuge was used to collect military intelligence from German military officers imprisoned at the estate at Trent Park. It's a pretty wild read. The plan is to have British intelligence officers interrogate the German POWs relatively poorly and then let the POWs go hang out together without oversight in bugged bedrooms where they will hopefully make fun of the inept British intelligence officers revealing military secrets to the bugs. This apparently worked rather well, by the way. It turns out that John Weatherby was one of the pretend inept intelligence officers. Joanna had known that her father served in naval intelligence during the war, but hadn't found details of his service. In the course of learning more about the operation, I put Joanna in touch with Helen Fry, the book's author, who was consulting on a massive project converting the estate at Trent Park into a national museum where, for example, letters that John Weatherby to his, wrote to his wife during the war are going to be on display. So what is there to take away from these far-flung anecdotes? In my view, three points are the most central. First, everybody should work with legacy materials when they get the chance, because you are bound to encounter fascinating and unexpected stories in the records of lives that legacy materials represent. And that's cool and fun. Second, it is really important that I let myself be distracted by the seeming irrelevancies of the Raptor's claws from Lapland or the mention of Weatherby in a book about World War II, because my willingness to be absorbed by these traces of her father was an important factor in Joanna's increasing trust in me to represent her father faithfully which has in turn resulted in more access to increasingly personal parts of her father's life. Uh, in many ways, this um, is part of the process of fulfilling my ethical obligations to her as the owner of these materials. But finally, I've been struck by how my taking an interest in these very divergent things has thickened the archival ecology around the language archive that I am building. My interest in Weatherby's participation in the Lapland Ecological Expedition has led to Joanna placing them in an appropriate archival home, and my interest in his role in intelligence gathering is leading to him having a prominent place in a national museum. I envision both of these developments being positive for the discovery and transparency of my deposit of his So and Yangi materials at ELAR. In terms of discoverability, I'm optimistic that the ELAR deposit will be pointed to in the Lapland Archives metadata and in the National Museum's exhibit. In terms of transparency, I think it's powerful to connect Weatherby's data collecting enterprise from the 1960s, after he moved to Uganda as a teacher in the colonial administration and while a PhD student in the um, new post-colonial University of Bukerere, with his contributions to the imperial project of Arctic exploration and to the war effort all enterprises with wide resonances in the study of late colonial developments. In summary, privately held legacy collections often have significance to their owners for altogether different reasons, such as by being physical traces of deceased loved ones or uh, legacy aspects of their legacy in public memory. A consequence of this is that gaining access to such treasured records can draw researchers far afield from what linguists usually feel equipped for. In addition to being personally satisfying and relationally sustaining, these excursions can enrich language archives based on the legacy materials and enhance their discoverability to broader audiences. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Here are some references, and I'm now happy to take some questions.